Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul's Episcopal Church. My name is Charlie Dupree, and I am the rector of St. Paul's here in Richmond, Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Lenten Speaker Series. I'm very much aware that recently we made it to the 500,000 marker of persons who have died from COVID-19. Uh, yesterday we gathered here on the steps of our church and told our bells and remembered those lost during this pandemic. And so I'd like to begin our time together in a spirit of prayer. Join me as we come together in prayer. Most gracious God, you have called us all to be on a journey. And we know now that we are in a season of pandemic. And even now we ask you to calm our hearts and lead us. And tonight we now name either aloud or in the silence of our hearts, those whom we love whom we have lost to COVID-19. We pray for the medical community and those who attend to the sick. And we pray for those who mourn. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation. In their loneliness, be their consolation. In their anxiety, be their hope. And in their darkness, be their light. Amen. Again, everyone, welcome to St. Paul's Episcopal Church and welcome to the 2021 Lenten Speaker Series. Typically, we'd all be here gathered in this beautiful sanctuary of St. Paul's. We'd have a simple time of worship together. We'd have eaten or would be preparing to eat a delicious lunch prepared by faithful members of St. Paul's and by Episcopalians from across Richmond. Clearly, clearly this year is different. When the design team for the series came together in late December to put together our list of speakers, we immediately, immediately decided that we should invite artists. We also quickly decided to focus on the theme of the journey. Not only is the theme of journey big in the Bible, the idea of journey has been a major part of our last year. We have been journeying and it has been a blur. And who better to help us name and describe and give voice and meaning to our journeys than artists. In this series, we will hear about the journeys of five different artists they are poets, they are authors, they are visual artists, and they will talk about their journeys. And our hope is that in their journey, you will see your journey. And that ultimately, we hope to make known the, the commonalities of the human journey, a journey toward knowing each other and self more completely. Dave Coogan is here, and he will be with us at each of our events. Dave and his family are faithful members of St. Paul's, and Dave is also a teacher, an author, and a person dedicated to helping others find their own voices through writing. His journeys take us into the lives of the incarcerated, into the jail system, into the lives of those we may never encounter. Dave will serve as our guide and conversation partner as we take this journey 
with our speakers. If you have any questions throughout the next hour, I invite you to put them into the Q&A, into the Q&A, and we'll see what we can do to work them into the conversation. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Let the journey begin. Dave. All right. Well, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Hamilton Glass. Hamilton, reveal yourself. <laughs> Uh, Hamilton uh, is a visual artist. His career uh, as an artist stems from his architecture and design background. And despite working in architecture for seven years, his passion for public art has pushed him to start a new career. And what an amazing career it is. If, if you drive around Richmond, if you've been into any of our public schools and uh, other facilities, you have likely already seen Hamilton's work. Uh, public art has been a big influence and inspiration for him uh, because of its power to influence and inspire the community. Uh, with every project that he is given to create, a message is built that connects the work of the community uh, to which it lives. Hamilton's work usually is distinguished by his use of architectural elements with bright, vivid colors and sharp lines. The colors and unpredictable lines are used to convey a certain energy and movement in each piece. Um, I think you're going to enjoy his presentation. He's going to give us an overview of that work, um, and we're going to get to know um, how he journeys through his visual art and how he includes other people uh, throughout the process, both in the making of the art and in the experience of it. So let's take a look at it. Let's, let's enjoy it. Let's drink it in, um, and then we'll have a time for some conversation with Hamilton. Thank you all for, for having me. I'm so I'm so delighted to be here and be uh, talking and especially about journey because I've definitely had uh, a, a, a quite a journey in my in my career, especially as a public my short career as a public artist. So I appreciate you guys having me here. Um, so uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia uh, and uh, being from Philadelphia, public art has always been a really big part of my life. Uh, and as a part, you know, a part of uh, public art being a part of my life, one of the things that I didn't notice when I was a child uh, that I notice now looking back at it is that the, the public art in Philadelphia has always kind of represented the community. It's always, it, it looked like me, if that makes any sense. Um, and so in Philadelphia, you can't walk a block without seeing a mural. Um, and I didn't kind of pick up on that or notice that. And so I went to places that did not have public art that did that or public art in general. And so um, when I uh, graduated high school, one of the things that I wanted to do was do something creative, but I didn't have any representation of, of you know, artists who of an artist in general. Uh, and so I didn't think that I could do that. I didn't think I kind of fell for that stereotype of um, they're not being, you know, put, you know, they're not being any, any successful artists, a live artist, you know what I mean? There's a stereotype of a starving artist. And so, um, so I, I initially went into architecture because of that. And so, uh, and when I did go into architecture, I immediately kind of knew that, hey, this is this is not what I want to do. This is not the creativity that I, I went for. But um, I also didn't want to waste my mother's money or waste my family's money. So I, I kind of stuck with it. Um, but I, and I made architecture by art because architecture is a, a type of art. And so um, in doing that, um, of course, I graduated uh, from Hampton University with a, a bachelor in architecture and practice for seven years. And then when I once I did that um, around 2008, 2009, I lost my position because of the recession. And so when I lost my position, that really hit me hard because I was like, wait, I did everything right. I'm, I'm working. I went to school for this. I'm working. Uh, no one told me about this recession thing. <laughs> no one told me that I could lose my position in this. Um, and that hit me hard too, because I, I also wasn't doing something that I loved. I was, you know, I enjoyed architecture, but it wasn't something that I loved. And so I, I uh, immediately kind of went 
told myself, hey, I've got to find something that I'm passionate about. And I went back into that art, that ve that art vehicle um, that I that I love so much. And so when I did that, I was probably around 28, 29 years old, and I kind of lost my fear of um, perfection. And I was and, and it was kind of like, you know what, this is this is what I'm passionate about. I'm going to I'm going to go public with it and I'm going to make mistakes in front of people. Uh, I'm sure you guys have have seen artists or spoke to an artist and, and you say, hey, this looks great. You should show it. And they go, uh, it's not quite ready yet. Yeah. Right. I, I lost. It. I did that also, but I lost it. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. Um, and I started, I created more work in that one year of, um, that one year of being unemployed than I created in my whole life. And, and, and when I did that, I also had the courage to show it. And so as soon as I started showing it, I, I uh, just really was given every opportunity in the world, including the opportunity to uh, do a piece of public art. And um, by that time I had, I had, was living in Richmond and I noticed that there wasn't much public art. And um, I just I just really kind of went for it and said, hey, this isn't here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my hand in it. Still not thinking I could be a full-time public artist, but uh, but I went for it and I really fell in love with the process of doing that. Um, and I got some really good opportunities, some opportunities I probably um, shouldn't have gotten. And uh, in doing that. Like I said, I fell in love with the process and I, I really started thinking about that community aspect in which I was missing um, from you know, growing up in Philadelphia. And I started working with small nonprofits like Art 180 um, who do a lot of uh, what I call uh, creative fostering, if that makes any sense. It, it's not really teaching a class, but it's more exposing kids to creativity in general. Um, and when I did that, I fell in love with it. It was, that was, it was, it was great because I get to, got to learn who was in the Richmond arts community. And um, while also being able to talk to kids who, who, who don't have that fear, right? They, they just do um, and expose them to a lot of things. And, and from there, the trajectory was kind of just up. It was just, it was great. I was I was being able to I was able to show kids how to be creative while also learning myself from them how to you know lose that fear and do things. Um, I think I have a slide presentation that I'm going to that I want to show too, um, and I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of those projects. Um, so next slide, um, and so this is a project. Uh, this is this is kind of the beginning for me in that and with Art 180, I did this project called What Do You Stand For? Um, and the, the thing that's so great about uh, doing projects with Art 180s and other like minded um, organizations is um, we would do these public art projects, but they would they would go outside of the studio. They would they would travel this 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 one in particular went to Monument Avenue, but it traveled for a year. It went all over um, Richmond. And so if you can imagine having, you know, 60 kids who get to do their self-portraits and also talk about why that self-portrait is important to them and have it travel all over Richmond, it's, it's an opportunity that a lot of people don't get to do. Um, and so again, I was blessed to be able to be a part of things like that. Um, next, next slide, please. And so, and after after doing that uh, again, in that trajectory of kind of um, doing more and more public art, um, I found myself in 2012 being able to to be a full time public artist. Um, and in and in doing that, I understood it rang it rang to me that hey, now I'm doing something that I didn't think I could do, and I'm also working with kids at. At, at public schools and things like that, it's kind of my my uh, my duty to be that representation that I didn't have of a of a working artist who's making a living and doing it. And so, um, I from 2012 until now, of course, I've I've been a full time public artist, but I've I've been able to do uh, I've, I have over 200 murals here in Richmond. 
I do work all up and down the East Coast. Um, this was one of my first murals here, which is right across the street from Part 180. And it kind of holds a special place in my heart uh, for one, because it was, it was one of the first murals I did going, you know, of being a full-time artist, but for two, Art 180, I really give Art 180 credit for kind of like helping me foster that spirit of, of um, my career path of, of um, working with kids and, um, and not just creating work for me, right? Creating work for the community and creating work um, so kids can kind of see uh, where their cr creativity can lead to. Next slide, please. Hamilton, you keep mentioning yeah. kids. Can you talk a little, do you, do you have a call to work with kids? Why kids? Absolutely, yes, so I, I do. I think they, they hold a little of that, that uh, fearlessness um, that, that holds us back as adults. We, we think too practically, we mm -hmm. think too, um, we're, we're a little stiff when it comes to creativity. And, and I don't just mean like visual creativity, I, I just mean possibilities also, right? We think a little too stiff. Um, and so in those sessions that I, you know, that I did, that I work with kids, I often learn um, just as much as they're learning from me. Um, because the possibilities are kind of endless. Um, and once I started thinking I could be a full-time artist, that's when I became one, if that makes any sense. Sure. So I, I fully kind of give them credit for that. And then working with um, corporations um, who, who allow me to kind of get into these schools, right? Who, who, who fund a lot of these projects, um, I, that's where I kind of realized that I was that example. And so what I started doing is I would do these, these large, these large murals. Um, but I would, I would then go talk to the art teacher and say, Hey, can I talk to your class? And of course they say, absolutely. But that wasn't part of my job description, but mm -hmm. I just knew that I had to be that representation, um, that representation that, that I didn't have because I was, I was breaking my own stereotype in my head of, of what, of, you know, what I could be and what yes. I could do. So I, I try to preach that to, to um, the kids that I, that I do work with, because I think representation is so important in having, and, and not just with art, right? It's, it's anything you can, you can literally do anything um, if you know the business of it and, and you believe and you and you work really hard at it. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. Before before you move away from this one, um, mm -hmm. it's it's all right if you're there now. But um, the the previous um, picture of the of the woman staring off into the into the um, looking looking straight up, and then the one before that of the, the the young man who was you said the the theme was what do you stand for? I'm just noticing in these portraits these strong characters that are looking off um, with some kind of insight, uh, like they're on a journey, <laughs> like they're searching. And I was, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about, about that, the way you, you chose those subjects or how you figured out how to, how to, how to paint them. Were they searching for some meaning, some insight? Um, that's a, that's a great question. So each one of my projects has a really good, has, has, a, has a purpose. Um, this particular one, was uh, is on Emmerich Flats, and Emmerich Flats used to be a car dealership, um, and so the that is actually a 1920s hood ornament from a from a Chevy, mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> so so um, the the residents commissioned me to do this because they wanted something cool. But they also wanted something that really paid homage to what the building was. And if you knew, you knew if that, may, if that makes any sense. Um, uh, and then the, the slide before, I believe, was my self-portrait and me and working alongside the kids and doing that. I've been told that the work that there's, I always have a, a really heavy expression in my, in my work. I think that's just the nature of the way I like to paint and um, my subjects in general. Um, because I always, I never want to tell you exactly what it means, but I always want to, uh, you know, kind of allude to something like that, that they're thinking about something or they're doing something. Next slide, please. 
you can keep going. Next slide. Um, and so this is this is um, this is a community center in Petersburg. Um, and uh, again, you'll you'll really see as we kind of page through these slides, and you can go to the next slide. But as we page through these slides, um, you'll really see that they are not just um, pretty pictures. So that community center one that we were just at talks about um, what that building was before. It used to be a YMCA. It used to be a community basketball court. Um, right now, um, or at least at that time, Virginia State University was using it for indoor farming. Um, and uh, so I feel like I, I kind of get that call when people want, you know, want a message in their, in their stuff. The, what the slide that we're currently looking at is at Battery Park. Um, where, um, which is, which happens to be the neighborhood that Arthur Ashe grew up in. And uh, art can also be used as a tool to kind of not just highlight, but also bring attention to. This tunnel that we're looking at right now um, was in disrepair. Uh, and um, there, when we first uh, kind of thought about doing this, it, it, it's a it's a tunnel that is in between two parts of Brooklyn Park, and it's always closed, right? Because it's it's in disrepair, it's dark, bad things can happen in it if it's you know if it, it's dirty, um, and so we wanted a way to to find to to get that tunnel open, and so uh, we thought about, of course, on one side is tennis courts and one side is basketball courts, and we thought about all right, how can we use art to really bring this back? And so we approached the city about um, doing a tribute to Arthur Ashe um, and bringing, you know, and brightening that, ton that tunnel up. And, and as soon as we did, I mean, the city was like, okay, let's get some lights, you know, let's make sure this is open for tours. Um, and it's, it's a great way to kind of bring history to a place, get someone to know about what's actually going on here, but to also, um, activate the, the community into actually making it a place, creative place making, if, if that makes any sense, making it a, a functional space. Next slide, please. And like I was said, I, I've worked with more than just Art 180. This is Girls for a Change. Um, one day I was listening to one of these young ladies um, give a speech. Um, they are a part of Girls for a Change. I should explain who Girls for a Change is first. Girls for a Change is an organization. Um, what I like to say is they give a lot of access and opportunities to black and brown girls. They're, they're uh, a, a organization that's focused on, um, on black and brown girls, but also get, getting them opportunities and um, just access to various programs and things like that. Um, and so I heard one of um, the young ladies speeches about um, how they see themselves and how they would like to see themselves in Richmond. And I immediately called Angela Patton who, who runs Girls for a Change and told her like that speech was amazing. Um, there was one part about it that really perked me up which is um, changing the narrative and actually um, uh, having representation that shows, you know, shows us the way we want to be shown. And I said, how can I help with that? Um, and so we found a location and I worked with one of their, um, their girl action teams at uh, John Marshall High School and the girls designed it, they helped paint it. We had uh, um, Virginia Credit Union sponsor the project, um, but it's opportunities like this where the girls, I'm, I'm pretty sure none of those girls thought they could paint a 140 foot mural. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but they did, and they also got the design. And so every time, you know, they walk past it or, or something like that, they get to see what they've accomplished and also get to see how this big and bright message that they created um, for all of RVA to see. Next slide, please. And so in doing this, I've had the really fortunate opportunity to, to work with, honestly, both of the museums, the VMFA and the VMHC here in Richmond. Um, this one was done uh, for their fresh paint exhibit. 
uh, in 2018, um, where myself and nine other public artists did a, did a representation of something we found inspirational um, or wanted to talk about there and there, Virginia, um, their permanent uh, exhibit, uh, for their permanent home Virginia exhibit. And so uh, one of the things that really stood out to me in that exhibit was the first mural that was painted in that building, which um, was uh, highlighting the, confeder the Confederacy. And so I wanted to depict something that was a little bit more truthful in my eyes um, to where, you know, where America was at the where America is and, and was and how that history really played out. Next slide, please. And so this is just more examples. I, I it just in the sake of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna move a little bit quickly, but this is just an example. This is the Legacy Academy, um, which is run by um, RCC Richmond Cycle Corp. Um, what I approach Richmond Cycle Corp also because when Every time I hear about Richmond Cycle Corp, you hear about the amazing work that they're doing with bikes and the and the boys, but they do so much more than that for those for those boys. Um, and and this building is actually a testament to it. Uh, moving over uh, into this neighborhood where they where they service most of these boys, where the, most of these boys are on their cycle team. And so I want I approached uh, Craig. Dotson over there and told him, I want to do a mural that talks about the work that you do, like the mentoring, the mentorship that you do. And um, this is kind of the, the end result of that. Next slide, please. And this is another really good example. I've worked with MLK uh, Middle School and we uh, did two separate programs that, that kind of sprucened up the uh, Martin Luther King Bridge, um, and they they helped throughout the summer and through I believe the fall to to make this this mural possible. Next slide, please. And this is just more murals that I've done here in Richmond. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show a natural progression of the work that I've done. Um, just recently, RVA Community Makers. Um, was revealed at the VMFA, which this is our third year, but what's shown here is the first year I approached the VMFA about doing a RVA community maker project. I wanted to find a way to make the VMFA a little bit less intimidating. Um, and especially during Black History Month. Um, so I, I approached the VMFA and talked to them about doing a project that highlighted um, Black grassroots leaders um that and 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 have them highlighted through the museum and again have a project that has some some sort of community engagement so each year this is our third year but each year it has some type of community engagement product product uh project um but it's really been really successful and uh it's it's this is just kind of what i do i love doing projects that bring people together and get everyone um, working to, together to do a, a, in a common goal. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And I think you can keep going. I, I, I really just wanted to kind of show some, some symbolism of all the work that I've been doing here in Richmond. Recently, um, in 2020, um, of course, uh, you know, Everyone knows what we've been going through from COVID to the recent uprising and, and, and the sensitivity about uh, racial and social justice. Last year, um, right after the the um, right right after uh, the George Floyd protests uh, and uh, killing, I started thinking about a project that would kind of bring us together uh, through through empathy and connection. And I wanted to find a project that, that really furthered the conversation of racial and social justice, because I, I thought that that's what we need. I think that that's what we need um, in general. Um, right after um, George Floyd was murdered, I had a, a really hard conversation, not hard, but a, a really long conversation with a fellow collaborator 
who um, happens to be a different race than me and um, comes from a different background than me. And we had this really long conversation about why this was different from him. And I was upset because, well, a man was killed, but to me, I didn't understand why I didn't understand why people were just now waking up to this. And so my, my, my talk with him, he really dug into it for him. And he, there were some things that we talked about that really kind of opened my eyes. Um, not to say that he was right or, or I was right, but really, you know, it just really brought that connection. And I thought that we, we really could kind of uh, bring artists together from different backgrounds and kind of, uh, and kind of do the same thing, get them to talk about racial and social justice uh, and, and, and create public art that talks about uh, empathy and connection. And so that's kind of what we did. And so I brought a, a, like a small three minute, um, a three minute trailer for you all to see. And uh, we can look at that now that just kind of wraps up how the project went for us last year. You know, when the George Floyd thing happened, I was getting really frustrated. Frustrated about, I was getting really frustrated about like why so many people were now seeing this George Floyd as different when Ahmaud Arbery happened two weeks ago. It's been carnage after carnage after carnage, and I was upset about it. And so I reached out to the artist Matt Lively and had a conversation with him who had a totally different viewpoint on it than I, I did. He was telling me like why it was different to him. And it really, it gave me some hope and it really like made me think of doing something different. Maybe getting together a project that put artists together from different backgrounds to collaborate on public art projects and getting them to be like a, like a microcosm of what society needs to do right now. We need to talk, we need to listen, um, and we need to empathize and connect. And so once we did that, that kind of commemorated the first kind of kicking off of the Mending Walls project. 10,000 hours ain't enough for the goal. I see your head. This pain, it don't want me to grow. But I'm being led to my destination, driven by motivation. What you call a slow creep, I call pacing. Patience, destiny is what I'm chasing. Facing many challenges while embracing. Yeah. I see public art as a way to have a greater conversation, and that's what this project is about. What are the things that you see need to be destroyed in order to create something new. And then cover those up with something beautiful and a rebirth, if you will. I like the collaboration where it doesn't feel like either of our separate work. Stop. I know it's gonna take a lot of pain just to see the game, but I promise that I won't quit till the winners be in crown. Yeah, I swear I feel it's right in my yeah. soul. I've just seen a lot of conversations and have just been hearing from a lot of artists where school teachers, community centers are reaching out and asking them to come talk about it. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Just say that a mural is worth a thousand words. Yeah. This is an incredible gift to our community. So I work until my hands ain't clean. It's a risk. I expand until the chance ain't seen. Take a second to breathe. Now I'm back at the max. I would never let up in fact. Look, and I won't stop. We came together and we had those tough talks. Before we talked art, before we talked anything, we talked family. I got a chance to get to know them. For, for the first time in forever, some people are seeing things in a different light. And that gives me hope. Yeah, so last year that was Mending Walls. And again, that, that, that is the project that I was just speaking about. 
And it really has been a pleasure to be able to, to kind of put that together and get so much support behind that project. We did 16 walls um, all over Richmond and are planning to do some more this year. Um, you can, and you can just page through this really quickly. I'm gonna wrap up, but um, this, this work is so important. Hopefully through this journey you've seen of my, of my own, this personal journey you see of, of my own, you see how I try to, to kind of put community first in all of my work because that's where the worth comes from. Um, that's, that's what makes it worth it. Um, these, these pieces of public art live in communities and they really should reflect it. And, and um, just looking back at my past and in, in my individual background, it, it just feels like I was meant to do this. Um, being from Philadelphia and then coming to, to Richmond and, and kind of um, the rich grassroots um, uh, movers and shakers here in Richmond, I, I've never found a place where I've had so much support in my, in my life. And so um, being able to do this just has been amazing. Um, yeah. It is amazing. And thank you for that. Thank you for sharing all that, Hamilton. Um, you know, what's compelling as I, as I look through all the, the work you've shown is that the, the colors are so vibrant. And, you know, if you, if you had any fear of, of doing your own artwork, it didn't show up in color. <laughs> yeah. you, you really, you're not afraid of color. Um, and, and also the themes are bold. Uh, the, the themes really do engage us in the deepest questions of community. And the way you talk about the work is is also bold. One of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about about community that's compelling to me, just as I as I look through the work, is the questions that must have been animating your mind and also the minds of the people around you, whether they were the kids in, in uh, any of those organizations or schools or the other adults or or, or other artists that you're working with. Um, because everybody comes to community, it's one of those warm, fuzzy words that it's hard to disagree with community just when you hear the word, but nobody really knows exactly who's in or who's not in. And your, your work seems to kind of go right to the core of that and say, you know, we can form a community through questions if we can commit to solving, you know, to answering the questions. Um, so could you reflect on that a little bit more um, in terms of what you started off with in the questions that you, you first were asking as an artist? and what you learned yeah. along the way? That's a really good question. Um, the, so the community is, because I get that question a lot, the community is who it affects, right? And who cares too. Um, and often, especially when I'm dreaming of pro, uh, uh, projects like this, that is the first thing that I ask myself, like, who is this affecting? Who's gonna care about this? Who is this going to bring, um, joy to who is this going to uh who is this going to uplift um and why should it uplift or why you know you know what i'm saying and I so see. it's really who it's bringing worth to and so that is a question you're right and and that's it's taken me a long time to kind of um kind of realize that that that's the way that i start formulating projects Right. Um, but it's always it always starts with a problem or a um, yeah it always starts with a problem or a or a bringing worth to. Uh, I to, mean to start, it, and it starts simply like you you wanted the VMFA to be more accessible or less intimidating, and those right. pictures of the people that we know or maybe would love to to meet through through their their representation those activists. That, that's a great way of, of raising the question, who is art for? And who, who feels welcomed into this space, right? That's, that's such a great point, right. And, and even to speak to the RVA community makers in general, RVA community makers was something um, that I think speaks to exactly what you were talking about. I, I was thinking community members never see themselves in paintings up in, art museums that doesn't happen <laughs> you know what I mean um and for that for that and then also artists who local artists 
usually aren't in uh, museums, art, fine art museums, right? And so this that project did both, does both. Um, and so it's, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, but along the way, um, you know, you, you said in the beginning of your, your remarks that you wanted you wanted the city to to feel more like like you or like what you see, like it was in Philadelphia, right? You wanted you wanted to see right. in it, and so you came to Richmond. Would you say that you've are you are you halfway there to feel? Are you all the way there? <laughs> and, you know, and what roadblocks have you encountered along the way? Because it sounds to me like you started asking the questions, and you formed different coalitions of all different kinds of people, and people want to answer these questions with you. Yeah, I I totally agree. I don't, I don't know what percentage I'm there. I don't think you ever kind of really arrive. Um, I I just I think that the possibilities are a little bit more open. We we know the art, especially the public art community here, is is thriving, right? Because we are starting to kind of answer those questions, and we're seeing people get things like this done, like this project done. Um, yeah, I, it, I don't think there's a, there's an ending destination to that. I just think that, um, again, we want to see ourselves reflected on the walls or, or, or in the sculptures, it's public art in general. We want to be in control of our environment. Um, and that brings you back to me, back to architecture. Uh, so, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's just really important to be able to have stake in your surroundings. And um, for me, public art is the way to do that. Right. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Um, I got a question from uh, somebody that's watching. First of all, I'm getting a lot of uh, thank yous, Hamilton, to you from, okay. from, the, from the viewers, uh, people showing such appreciation, um, not only for the, the art, for the art itself, but just the spirit around it and and, and behind it. Um, uh, someone wants you to talk about the community art murals for COVID all in together and the recent digital version for Black History Month that many of us participated in by designing a page that you fit together. Yes. What, what are they talking about? Yeah. so. Um... I've been a busy guy for these last two years. Uh, it starts with those problems that Dave was talk, David was just talking about. So um, in the beginning of uh, March of last year, when we all went into quarantine, um, I, was, I was talking to, again, talking to uh, my frequent collaborator, Matt Lively, um, and, and got a little discouraged also then because I was thinking, you know, I'm a community engagement artist. The, my work in, heavily involves community engagement. So not being able to be close to people is a problem <laughs> for me. Um, and so uh, I, and I was noticing all of these artists putting out coloring sheets for, you know, students and kids who are home, right? To give people something to do. Uh, and so I just thought to myself, there's gotta be a way we can get these things together we can we can make some type of things together and a couple of years ago i did a project with matt lively at a high school at freeman high school to be specific where we cut up uh we cut up an image and had each art student kind of do their own square for that image and and we ended up blowing that up and it hung in regency square mall and things like that and so i i put that that idea along with these coloring sheets that have been uh, that that people were putting out, and we created this mural uh, project called All In Together, uh, where people could download a coloring sheet that was kind of like a small little piece of a larger mural. Um, and so, not only would people could people they could download it and they could scan it and send it back, and for those who didn't have printers or uh, uh, printers or or scanners, we we actually kind of I think we distributed five thousand coloring sheets all over the city to different organizations, and and then also went and picked those up, um, and so 
uh, what we did was we made the, these, uh, these murals that could be put together and then displayed anywhere. And the thought behind that was not just to get, you know, give people a creative thing to do, but also these murals could also serve as like a timestamp of, hey, remember, I did that when we were in COVID, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it, it almost becomes a symbol of us being together while being apart. Um, and so we did that for, for um, Richmond Public Schools, uh, Chesterfield County Schools, um, and a lot of different community centers all over. And recently I just launched um, a Black History one uh, on the website and that the website is all in together va.com so you can kind of see it there and uh, download a sheet and, and uh, scan it and send it back and it all fits together and, and the the it's it, it is a coloring sheet but it's also more than just a coloring sheet so I encourage people when they do stuff like that so that you can you can collage you can do poetry on it you can use it as a journal it really is kind of an outlet to kind of um, put your individual self on this sheet to, to bring together again as a community, to bring together and be part of this larger, this larger image. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's compelling. You're irrepressible, man. You just, you can't, no, no, no pandemic is going to stop you. <laughs> uh, there's a will, there's a way. Right, right. Um, can you share any stories of, of obstacles that you've encountered along the way in trying to pursue these questions of justice and, and community forming? I know you alluded a little bit to it in your presentation about the conversation, uh, the first conversation you had with, with Matt that uh, after the George Floyd murder. Um, have there been other moments like that where you've kind of confronted uh, an obstacle that you had to figure out another way around? I think, I mean, the biggest obstacle is not knowing everything. And I know that sounds cliche, but um, Mending Walls grew so fast last year, to be specific about that project, Mending Walls grew so fast last year that I had to kind of understand that there was no right answer. And it was just a, it was a platform to kind of, for everyone to have a, have a voice. And talking with all of the artists, and there were 30 different artists that in, were involved in this, actually more than that, that were involved in that project, um, they, they were just really thankful that they actually had a second to have a voice in that. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we're going to focus on, with focus and do work with organizations um, that are actually on the ground doing the work. So there'll be like a three-way collaboration where people are really now talking to the people who are, you know, we're going beyond the conversation. We're, we're still having it, but we're going beyond, we're, we're talking to people who are, or talking to organizations who are on the ground and doing the work. Um, and so it's, everything is tough. I mean, in my personal work, uh, I have a problem with not coming up with projects. So I'm the I'm the grant writer. I'm the, I'm the painter. I'm the you know I'm everything. I think um, I I think it's just just been it's it's just tough kind of navigating um, all of the different facets that need to um, come into making a good project. I think um, one of my challenges right now is being able to kind of pull together more resources to make more holistic projects because I'm a painter. So I'm focused on that, but there are other people who are focused on, on other things that can enrich the kids or whoever's involved um, experience in doing that. Hey, Hamilton, I've got another question from a viewer. Uh, they wanna know about your mother. Uh, this person says that they're struck by your sticking to architecture school because you didn't want to disappoint your mother. Tell us about your mother, her influence on choices you have made on your journey. That's a great question. So my mother, um, yes, I stuck with architecture. College was something that was um, very intimidating for me. Um, and I knew how hard my mother was working to get me there and I did not want to disappoint her. And architecture is actually one of those majors where um, it's so heavily credit based in your studies that, you know, to, to, to kind of 
say no to a studio is to push you all the way back as a freshman, I guess. Um, and so I just didn't want to do that. And architecture is, is an art. It, it, it actually really is. I, I started making my architecture about art. Um, so I, I don't advise that anyone does that, but, but I, I started doing that. And that was my way of kind of getting through architecture school. My mother also um, kind of noticed that I had um, this passion for art at a very young age. And I, I can remember her putting me in every single art class I could ever, and, and I can remember being 10 years old and being in, in, a, in a class with, you know, like 65 year, 65 year olds drawing nudes and hating it and saying, and, and later on in life, I, I asked my mother about that. And she was like, well, every class I put you in, they said you were a little bit too advanced. So, you know, by like 10 or 12, you were in Philadelphia Art Institute doing this. And honestly, that sucked the, um, the fun out of it for me. It really did. It, it made me, you know, I was 12 or 10 years old. I was, I was like, I don't like people telling me how to create art. I'm, I did this for fun, right? I didn't, I, I'm not doing this to, in my eyes, to get better. I was, I was doing it for fun. And so that really kind of took me off art for a minute. But um, my mother had always believed that art was something that was going to kind of get me through life. And so it's, you know, being older and looking back on that and understanding how much determination and passion my mother had for me um, to, to use my gift. I can't thank her enough for that. Uh, to be able to have someone who believed in me that much and um, has supported everything I, I've done, it's just been, a, it's been amazing. She must be proud of you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Charlie, did you have any other questions from the chat? I haven't been. What um, if we do this? I've got one more question from the chat. There's there's several, so I'm, I apologize. We just don't have time to get to all of them. So why don't I ask a question, and then Dave, you can ask um, one of one of your wrap up questions that we had planned, and then we'll we'll call it a call it a night. Um, Hamilton, one person says, uh, can you describe your experience creating and putting up art as the community? now is taking down Lost Calls art of the past. Mm. So talk a little bit about what, what that feels like for you to be putting up art while other art of the past is coming, it's coming down. down. Honestly, I think that is kind of the natural progression of art in general. Um, even when my own art comes down, I think that is, that's what the community wanted. That's what, you know, we kind of determine what is valuable and what is not. And the art on the walls should reflect where we are in general. Again, it should, it should reflect our voices. And so if we're taking down, taking art down, it's, it's for a reason. It's, you know, it, maybe it doesn't reflect us anymore. Um, and, and all art, actually, all art doesn't live forever. And it, it's, in my opinion, it shouldn't. We shift and change and the art should shift and change with us. Well said, well said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Charlie, is it, is it, <laughs> are, you, are you turning the reins over to me or did you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, well, one of the things that struck me in your earlier comment about creativity was that you, you said it wasn't just in art or it shouldn't just be limited to art and that, that learning how to become creative. And, and if you're a kid, uh, in, a, in a program like, like Girls for Change or Art 180, you might not become an artist, um, but you, you're becoming artistic or you're becoming creative. And I think a lot of that, that process of trusting your creativity in, in any media, whether, whether it's in art or writing or music or anything else, is a, is a process of growing into your true self and, and becoming more authentically you. Mm -hmm. And what I love about your work is the way you've made that so openly and generously um, a, a part of the community becoming more itself, more, more true to itself by, by, by really heeding those, those questions about who we are and, and, and where we're going, especially with regard to, to justice, to racial justice. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was wondering if you had any words of, of um, advice or um, maybe just some insight that you've gained from that process to people that are not artists. How would you, how would you address their need to, to become more creative and more authentically human, to trust that self? Yeah, I think it's really just digging into the human experience, understanding how we work in general. Um, I think we all, as, as human beings, we all are kind of programmed um, by our experiences, right? And so the second we kind of pull ourselves out, pull ourselves out of our experiences, which is a really tough thing to do, um, but try to educate ourselves and pull ourselves out of our experiences, we can kind of understand why someone might have a different opinion or or why someone um, might be acting in a different, differently than you, right? And so that, and with that should come patience, if that makes any sense. And so with that patience is, that patience is what I try to have every day. And that, with that comes understanding. And um, it, it still doesn't mean you have to agree, right? It, it still doesn't mean you have to, um, to to be you know right on the same page with with that other person but it 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 gives you a certain patience that lets you be able to address everything if that makes any sense um and that's kind of where i try to come with come you know come at everything um and i i've been told i have kind of like this even keel you know that I, that I don't get upset and things like that. I, and that's not true at all. I, I definitely get upset and I have my human moments. Um, but just like, you know, when I had that conversation with Matt, um, he said a lot of things that some other, someone else might've gotten upset with, but getting, you know, listening and understanding that we have different experiences and then talking about why those experiences are making me feel that way or making him feel that way is 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 key right we all need to have some empathy some empathy in that and really meet each other try to meet each other on on a on a neutral ground absolutely i, I love that phrase you use pulling yourself out of yourself or out of your experience I, that's right. a great image of it too it just to think about how how wonderful it is when you trust that process that other people can be the the ones pulling that rope or helping you like, like Matt did with you or you did with Matt. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a, that's a beautiful thing uh, to, to trust that you can become, you can become something more without giving up anything. I think that's what the, the question about the art of the past coming down while new art is coming up, I think is related to that, that it's not a zero sum game where you lose something and something takes its place. It's right. We're always growing in our experiences. If we're willing to kind of, listen to those questions Absolutely. so thank you for that yeah um i can't help but ask this question um, your your uh your murals and even i've looked at some of your paintings and there's a holiness to them holiness uh, i icon iconographic almost is there a sense of spirituality that uh runs through your inspiration that's a good question i I definitely don't look at it like that. Um, I don't want to sit here and pretend that I do. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, emotion is what I focus on when I'm painting, especially a person. And I, and I tend to paint hands a lot also, because they also show an emotion in my opinion. Um, and so I think that's where that comes from. I think it comes from really focusing on trying to tell the viewer something without telling the viewer something. Um, in my opinion, art shouldn't tell you what it is, but you should, you should be pulled into um, guessing an expression or guessing um, something from it that, you know, that makes you feel something. And so I think that speaks louder than words and it, and it really, to that specific viewer, identifies the piece and who's to say you know it, it again from our experiences right and it, it could mean something totally different to two different people it could mean to something totally different and who's yeah. to say which one is right 
Do you have anything on deck? One last question from the, the Q and A. Uh, what's your next? What's your next project? Next project. What is my next project? Your next half dozen projects, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right now I'm really, I'm focusing really hard on uh, Mending Walls. So Mending Walls is um, gearing up and start trying to raise, raise funds to do a 2021 season. Um, there won't be 16 projects like last year, uh, but again, we're focusing on working with organizations in the community who are really on the ground and doing the work. So I'm, I'm really focusing on that. I have uh, a lot of different projects happening actually outside of Richmond. Um, tomorrow, I'll plug this tomorrow, um, I am going to be on a YouTube series called Black Renaissance, um, hosted by the Obamas, um, where I, I don't want to give it away, but I did something special at Meadowbrook uh, High School in Chesterfield. Um, and that airs tomorrow at 12 uh, p.m. Um, I've I just have a I have a bunch of public art pieces lined up for uh, out out of NDC and Baltimore um, coming up in the next couple of months. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Hamilton. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you for, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to be able to tell my story. Yeah. Thank story. you, Hamilton. Thank you, Dave. Thank you um, again. A lot, a lot of people expressing appreciation for for this conversation, um, and Hamilton for for making our our city better and more beautiful. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for being here tonight. It has been fun. Thank you again, Hamilton. Thank you, Dave, for this great conversation. Uh, on behalf of St. Paul's, thanks to you both. Um, if you'd like to learn more about how you can get one of our uh, pre-reserved limited menu Lenten lunches, <laughs> you can go to stpaulsrva.org and find out more. And also, if you would like uh, to make a donation, uh, you are welcome to do so by going to St. Paul's, or I think um, information may be in the chat. And if you do make a donation, uh, the, the the proceeds will go to support this series. Um, next week, I hope you'll join us. Uh, we will have Tanya Olson. Tanya Olson is a poet and a professor of poetry. So she is going to be reading some of her work. We're going to be engaging in conversation with her. And we look forward to hearing about her, her work, and her story. Thank you for being here. Have a beautiful night, have a beautiful weekend. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. See you next week. Bye-bye.